Coming up on Market to Market, trade talks come to the U.S. Senate committee room. Looking at how agriculture has reversed course on exports and commodity market analysis with Chris Robinson next. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next because a pioneer, our name, is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 19th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The consumer is still shopping, even with inflationary pressures in play. Retail sales added seven-tenths of a percent last month, according to the Commerce Department. That's two consecutive higher reports of items sold in stores, restaurants, and at the gas pumps. Elevated mortgage rates kept a lid on home buying. Existing home sales fell 4.3% in March, the first decline since December. Some of the same pressures were holding back the rural Main Street Index. The survey has been below growth neutral for eight straight months, even with a more than seven point gain last month as weaker commodity prices and higher storage rates weigh on bank CEOs in 10 Midwestern states. And many of those same areas in the survey have turned to global trade as a way to boost profits on the farm. We have two stories this week on trade. We'll look at one specific sector directly impacted by foreign imports. But first, the U.S. Trade Representative was called to the Senate Finance Committee and the subject of free trade agreements dominated the Q&A with lawmakers. Peter Tubbs leads off our coverage. Joining us this morning. This week, the Senate Finance Committee met with U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Catherine Tai to discuss the foreign trade initiatives of the Biden administration. The current agricultural trade deficit was a frequent topic. In the last fiscal year, ag exports declined by more than $17 billion and are forecasted to continue to drop to a record low in the coming year. We have run deficits before in the past, in the recent past. It happens from time to time. Part of the factor is a strong U.S. dollar, but also really, really strong consumer demand here in the United States. Even with the downturn last year, uh, 2021, 2022, and 2023 were uh, record-setting years for U.S. ag exports at 173, 197, and then 179 uh, billion dollars. And I think that the drop, even for 2023, reflects growth from 2021 numbers. So there are any free trade agreements that are currently being negotiated. So the short answer to be responsive to you is, no, we're not doing the big comprehensive agreements that are really great for ag and terrible for our industries, but we are nevertheless securing wins, $21 billion over the last three years. The, the challenge of that is when it's not an FTA, there's no certainty on it. And uh, that executive agreements come and go with administrations. An FTA has some semblance of certainty on it. Are there other new markets on the ag side that are pending? Yes, so there's the work that we've done with India across uh, uh, 12 uh, tariff areas where we've opened up um, opportunities for um, uh, tree nuts, um, cranberries. Uh, this is a little bit of a test for me. I think it was blueberries, uh, turkey, um, uh, duck. Uh, we'd also worked on pork earlier. Um, it, with Japan, we've opened up with the beef safeguard. We've got ethanol, uh, more ethanol going to Japan now, too. I'm on a bill that uh, would create a free trade agreement with United Kingdom. They're one of our longest and closest allies. And there isn't a single free trade agreement that this administration's entered into. Market access can come more quickly, more effectively, more in more agile ways if we are looking for those opportunities to score what we like to call singles and doubles, to rack up the score that way, as opposed to tying up opportunities over the course of many, many years in FTA negotiations that sometimes don't ever come into being. Um, on the how about, how about deficit, the easy FTAs? How about the UK? 
I think there are no easy FTAs. I don't know if you followed, but uh, the UK and Canada have been negotiating an FTA that they stopped negotiating because the UK won't talk ag uh, ag market access. And in fact, in the in the in the last years of the Trump administration, um, in those negotiations, uh, the UK had refused to put ag market access on the table. Ag market access is also something that has traditionally really uh, frustrated our efforts at large FTA-like exercises with the European Union. What has been China's track record on meeting its WTO commitments that it made at the time and moving toward a liberal democracy? Senator Warren, um, this is one of the greatest uh, disappointments, I think, in uh, trade policy over the course of the last 25 years. I've had a lot of conversations with um, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle uh, around um, China's accession to the WTO um, and um, uh, their descriptions of how disappointed they are uh, in terms of their expectations um, is very deep. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Trade exports were worth more than $3 trillion in 2023 to the U.S. economy. Agriculture, as you just heard, was 6% of that tally last year. Now, more value in those goods is coming into the country than out, running up a deficit of $773 billion. Farm products until recently were helping reduce that shortfall by sending products like corn, soybeans, and beef overseas. But that has changed a bit as Colleen Bradford Krantz reports in our cover story. As it had in some preceding years, the United States in 1960 exported more agricultural goods to other countries than it imported. That year also kicked off an uninterrupted stretch of 59 years of agricultural trade surpluses. Then in 2019, the U.S. ran its first agricultural trade deficit in nearly six decades. Exports were still generally on an upward trend, so few expressed concerns that imports had increased even more. But soon it happened twice again, in 2020 and 2023. With 2024 heading the same direction, a handful of ag and trade groups are speaking up about their concerns. The 2023 ag trade deficit is the largest on record at $16.6 .6 billion in the red, and the 2024 deficit is projected to be nearly double that. The United States is becoming more reliant on other countries for its food supply. Rethink Trade is an anti-monopoly nonprofit. Farm Action is a Missouri-based nonprofit working toward a fair food system. Anybody in agriculture circles, they, they hear this adage, you know, American agriculture feeds the world. But when you actually look at the numbers, the truth is, in terms of the food that you and I and we all eat, we're not even really feeding ourselves. While a strong U.S. dollar plays into the equation, some are concerned that the nation's international free trade agreements have helped some global companies, but may be harming U.S. producers raising more labor-intensive products, such as fruit, vegetables, or livestock. When you look at a value basis, the fruit and vegetables are definitely a higher value crop, and that's what we've growed uh, our reliance on importing those products. If we just converted one half of 1% of current U.S. farmland to specialty crops, we, we could have, um, you, you know, completely wiped out the deficit last year. The lamb industry has felt the impact of the trade shortfall. Large meat processors buying for U.S. consumers tend to choose cheaper lamb from places like Australia. In 2022, Australia accounted for 75% of the $1.53 billion worth of sheep and goat meat imported into the U.S. That same year and halfway through 2023, U.S. lamb feeders endured 15 consecutive months of losses. And unlike U.S. farmers raising many other single commodities, Sheep producers don't currently have an active government-subsidized insurance program. The sheep industry has asked for a U.S. international trade investigation into whether imports are causing substantial harm to the industry. RCAF primarily advocates for independent cattle producers, but is trying to help the sheep industry as the export-import balance is relevant to both livestock sectors. 
we've seen more imports and consumers have not benefited. Consumers are paying record prices for beef at a time when imports are skyrocketing. So what this tells us is this is a, a boon for the multinational meat packers because they can source beef from other countries, 20 different countries that do not meet the same production standards. While domestic production was collapsing, imports were increasing. And in 2006, this canary in the coal mine, the U.S. sheep industry, became the first livestock sector in America to be outsourced. If anyone wants to know the answer as to whether or not imports can destroy a domestic industry, you can see right here it has destroyed our commercial sheep industry. Today, 74% of all the lamb and mutton consumed in America is derived from foreign soy. Although U.S. sheep producers finally saw a glimmer of hope with positive returns beginning in June 2023, many had departed the business. Todd Hintz, who raises lambs with his wife Peg and their adult son, saw this in his region of northeast Nebraska. We have had, I think it's in our probably 20 miles, we have lost four, four lamb growers, um, our sheep, sheep farms. Some of them, um, it, I think the, the work was too much, and then some of the prices, I think the, the low prices kind of pushed them out. The nation's 2023 lamb crop was the smallest on record, with just over 3 million head. Last year, we were at the $2 break point, was our break even, just because of alfalfa and corn and, and feed costs were so high. If you have to buy everything, you probably weren't making any money last year. I think more and more people will be leaving. The work is hard and you have to be dedicated. And when you have the highs and the lows, the cycles, you know, of making money or losing money, it seems like when you have one bad year, it takes two years to make up for the loss. Iowa sheep producer Tony Vorm and his wife work other full-time jobs, but their Katahdin hair sheep operation is profitable as they have focused on breeding stock, which garners higher prices, as well as slaughter lambs. Seen a lot of increase and decrease. S see, lambing is seasonal, prices is seasonal. Um, Easter and, and uh, ethnic holidays, holidays are are uh, the peak season, um, but also have seen some, some volatility. Like last year, prices were really low, but the year before that, prices were at all-time highs. Vorm wonders if the U.S. should consider supporting its own producers more. We import a lot of land that we probably could import less and use more from here, um, so that sometimes drives the price down, I think. We import so much that you know, we've got a surplus. After years of lobbying started by the American Grass-Fed Association, which was concerned about misleading labeling, USDA last month finalized a new rule for country of origin labeling, saying that all meat products sold with the Product of USA label must be derived from animals born, raised, slaughtered, and processed within the U.S. We're not against imports. Uh, imports are important to our economy. What we need to look at is when those imports exceed the threshold <clears throat> where they begin to destroy our domestic supply chains, then we must take action. And we've long passed that in both the cattle and sheep industries. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market report. Attacks between Iran and Israel have upended many markets, while Argentina appears to be the biggest influence in commodities. For the week, the nearby wheat contract lost six cents, and the May corn contract shed two cents. South American harvest kept pressure on the soy complex. The May soybean contract fell 24 cents, while May meal cut 70 cents per ton. May cotton shrank by 393 per hundredweight. Over the dairy parlor, May Class 3 milk futures added $1.37. The livestock market was higher. June cattle improved 420. May feeders put on 780. And the May lean hog contract gained 235. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index increased 21 ticks. May crude oil lost 291 per barrel. Comex gold rose 36.20 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index was down 15 points to settle at 588.90. Joining us now, regular market analyst, Chris Robinson. Hi, Chris. How you doing, sir? 
This Iran, Israel, had a couple of questions, had a couple of texts today about this, wanting me to ask this. First blush, you look at the wheat market and think, oh, and crude. But it's more than that, isn't it? On oh, influence on the commodities? Absolutely. I mean, it's hard to hedge or predict uh, an event like that, how it will be felt around the, around the world. Obviously, the two easiest ones to look at were crude oil, but also the stock market. Um, people don't like you know, that type of uh, big uncertainty. And you also see moves in the bond market because if people get, it's called flight to quality. You don't want to own stocks, you want to own bonds. So it, it, it is a very quick reset. And you saw that last night. I was driving out here last night and, and when it all happened and I pulled over the side of the road for a while because I was getting some phone calls. But uh, fortunately, things have calmed down and that was a good way to end the week. Volatility was the story of the last two years. We seem to have had less. We're more range bound. Let's look at wheat specifically. We're kind of flirting with that 50 day moving average and we can't seem to break any way out of that. Is there any reason to think volatility is coming back to wheat? To wheat, no. Wheat has been, you know, just in a two year decline. Every time that we've had a fundamental story, and we've had plenty of them with uh, all the issues in Ukraine, it's pretty well documented that we've got very uh, low stocks. There's other countries in the world that have low stocks. Uh, we just got done with the supply and demand. That data is all out there. The problem is there's, there's still a lot of grain that's come out of the Ukraine. In fact, there's been a lot of stories about that. A lot of the uh, Western, Western Euro European farmers are not happy about all the grain that's been coming out of the Ukraine. So it's put pressure on wheat. And we've been in a two-year decline we look like we might be trying to, to turn the corner, but we've, we've had a lot of false starts in the last year and a half. And I think, um, you know, a lot is going to depend on what happens with the corn crop this year as to, uh, you know, what happens with wheat. I think if anything is going to turn wheat around, it's going to be an issue with corn. We've had that, though, where there's been some weeks where one... It's like it's in, it's the in vogue thing to say and then it's not. So tell me why these two are going to be paired moving forward. Well, there's a, we're heading into the growing season. There was no issue with the wheat growing season so far. We'll see what happens when it actually get, gets harvested. But these markets need a story because they're, we, we're just in a situation where there isn't, whether or not you believe it or not or whether or not you agree with it or not, the market's telling you that everything's oversupplied. And uh, you know, price is what matters. And when you look at the price decline that we've had in the grains in the last two years, that's been the number one uh, issue. Also, uh, the demand has, has pulled back. There were some stories out today where you know China is actually importing less than they have in the last four years in, in some certain categories. So we had a demand-driven market. We had an inflation-driven market. Those two kind of dual flames have gone away. You could argue that that's the China less interest in buying is what's influencing the stories we just saw about trade. But I want to get to corn for a minute because there was some bullish news that came uh, from the administration today on Friday as we record about E15. Is that a long-term bump for corn? Well, if you dig, I mean, initially it was a good, it's a good thing and it may have already been baked in. They've if you dig deeper into the story, they've done it for the past two years. They're just extending the time now into the summer. But like everything else, uh, every little bit helps. It helps our demand. It, it will continue to be a support for uh, corn demand. I mean, it, it still takes a third of our crop. Uh, a lot of people, you know, forget about that. We grow a 15 billion bushel crop, 5 billion of it goes to ethanol. Um, and any increased demand is supportive, especially when you've got Corn sitting here at, you know, call it a three-year low, 31-month low, depending. But, I mean, that's, that's really the issue. And we're, we're going to have to watch how that comes out here in the next three, four months. Let's talk that front month real quick before we get to the December contract. <clears throat> when you look at the near term when we're trading in that 50, again, 50-day 50 moving average, and but, again, on the lower side of things, any reason farmers should pry open the bin door and sell some of that? Well, we had a little bump on the acres report. And it didn't last. It looked like we were going to turn the corner on that. We had a nice, you know, uh, 20, 25 cent rally. Every time we've had a rally like that, it has not 
had any legs. So I'm, I remain in the camp that I think it's an SOS market. You want to sell on strength. I'd much rather sell and do a 25 or 30 cent rally than wait and sell it as we make new lows. Everybody's got a different approach, but I, I, I really do not like to sell the new lows. But uh, I've told you this before, when I was down in Houston at the Commodity Classic, a lot of people were in a situation where their bankers were saying, hey, you may have to sell some of the grain you're sitting on. If you have to sell it, sell it. Bite the bullet, get it done. But boy, uh, what the situation is right now, you could go out and re-own that corn for pennies on the month out through June, July. If we have a market, at least you'll get compensated. So I would, I would highly recommend that. If somebody feels like they have to sell corn, not because they don't want to, but you better reown it. Uh, real quick on, on that December contract, we saw some harvest get started, or some planting get started, and then it rained. Is rain going to put a damper on that December contract? Well, if you're a bull, you want to hope for, but uh, you know, uh, are we having you know, big planting delays? No. I think if you look okay. at the, the bigger patterns, the crop's probably going to get in, and uh, we'll have to just deal with it as it happens. Let's go to beans. We did finally get a small bounce off the monthly lows as we look at that South American harvest. Uh, again, though, that's a heck of a lot of crop coming into the, to the world market. Any chance on this May contract we can reverse course? Well, we tried again today. Again, that's the 50-day moving average. I write about this every day in a letter. You know, we need to get over that 50-day moving average. It's, it's, it's such a silly thing, but it gives the financial community a reason to stay short because everybody knows they're bet short. They are just following the trend. They, it's not nefarious. They're just, the market's moving lower. They're moving with the market as it goes lower. If the market turns, they will gladly cover all those shorts. And that's, I think that that's your bullish thesis. We've got to get something to get these guys to cover their shorts, and that'll be the start. Okay, that's the technical side of things. Let's talk fundamental for a moment. Uh, Jim in Illinois asked us on Facebook, thank you for the question, is there any fundamental out there on the horizon that could rally this corn and bean market? On the horizon, fundamentally, we, I mean, we're coming off of pretty tepid exports, not, not terrible, but tepid, that we're kind of on pace. If, I think if, if that market was to wake up, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn. Uh, that would be something that I think would catch people's attention. Attention. What's hurting that is the rise in the U.S. dollar. The dollar's just bumped up. It had been drifting lower. It bumped up with the uh, concerns about inflation. So that's that's something that's going to be we're going to have to overcome. But yeah, if 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 there is a demand story out there, that will uh, probably raise its head sometime in the next you know two to three months. In cattle. You wrote this week, we've had four years of puts versus hedges. Which one is one? Puts. Puts. I mean, go look at the, the pandemic lows for, for, I call it fat cattle, live cattle and feeder cattle both. We've been, you know, up and to the right. And that is the perfect market for someone to have used puts. Yes, you know, if you have a hedging account, you, 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 you really don't want to lose money in it, right? But if you're doing things right, you want to lose money in your head. You want to make money in the cash market. So anybody that used futures over the last four years, you left so much money on the table, it's not even funny because unless you were psychic, which nobody is, every time you sold futures, you capped your profits, capped your profits. If you had a put, you pay for the put, the price keeps going higher, you lose value in the put, but you make the money in the cash market, which is what we're here to do. Do you see that trend continuing? We had a cattle on feed today. Yeah. Uh, it came out and it was... Uh, a little bit bearish for the front months, probably a little bit supportive, especially out if you look at the numbers out into the, the fourth quarter. My guess is Monday will open higher. It just depends on, on how we settle. Uh, but that market continues to be a, you know, a nice bull market. The problem is we've had these nasty corrections, which have caught a lot of people off guard. But if you look at the big picture, which I always tell guys to do, we're still on an upward trajectory when you look at those weekly and monthly charts. On feed, 101, uh, placed on feed, 88, and then fed marketed, uh, 86. Let's get to be, or hogs for a minute. Uh, you, you wrote a little bit about the technical trade for hogs. You don't see fundamentals playing as much of a factor there? No, fundamentals, it's, it's been a good, really a gift for producers because we bottomed out in December. Then we started hearing stories about, you know, uh, certainly the Chinese uh, cut the size of their herd. If you look at other countries around the world, they've, they have a smaller herd than what they probably want to have. So it's benefited the U.S. And you've seen it in the prices. We had a tremendous 
a, you know, a, a 20 cent rally um, from December to March. The problem is then we get these corrections, these nasty corrections where we lose what, what takes four months, we lose 40% of it in three days and then everybody does what they probably shouldn't do, that and they sell into the break, right? Uh, but again, all these, all these markets have been really case studies for why if you're a producer and if you want to hedge, some people don't want to hedge. If you want to hedge, don't hedge. But if you want to hedge, the put has been your best friend because it's let you stay long with the floor so that when we have these corrections, you don't feel like, oh boy, I, I, I have to make a bad decision down here. So um, I, I, I still think that the, you know, the cattle herd is too small. That's a big long-term story that, that's not gonna go away tomorrow. And we've continued to have really good um, demand for our um, hogs. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Chris Robinson. We are gonna pause our analysis and continue our discussion about these markets. In our Market Plus segment, you can find both analysis and plus on our website at market2market.org. As Plant 24 rolls on, Prime Instagram season is here. We will post some of our own images and share your best work on our feed of at Market to Market Show. Follow along today. Next week, incentivizing farmers to protect a natural resource. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.